four. There we go. Right, and a uh, very big welcome to Liz from everybody here. So welcome, Liz. Don't forget to unmute, Liz. That's very helpful. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. Um, so as Fiona said, um, I'm a watercolourist and I'm based in Berkshire. Um, so what I wanted to do this evening is a pen and wash. And I wanted to try and tempt you into using a dip pen um, because a lot of us get terribly attached to using our micron pens if we do do pen and wash because they're so convenient. But dip pens bring so much more to the party. And I wanted to show you a homemade dip pen. But um, just uh, if you could um, spotlight my overhead camera, that would be brilliant. So these are my ingredients for, for the cola pen. But let me just show you. I'll just grab, whoops, painting, which is rather large for um, my camera. But so this obviously, Al, um, that I've used with the cola pen. And why I love the cola pen is that you can get these amazingly broad, strong ink marks and also very, very fine lines all from the one pen. So it's a really expressive way of working. And that's uh, hopefully we're going to end up something like that today, except not an owl. I've got an eagle. So um, I'm just going to move this stuff out of the way and just say, I mean, if you have used dip pens, you've probably used the, the sort of pen and holder type thing. You may have come across glass dip pens, which are gorgeous. So those are the commercial ones. You may have used a typical sort of, I mean, this is bamboo, bamboo, but a reed pen. But the cola pen started out um, really for calligraphy. And this is what it looks like. So, I mean, it's really not a thing of beauty at all. But the mark it makes is just fabulous. And um, I say it's so easy. All you need is a can, doesn't have to be cola. It can be tonic from your gin. It can be lemonade, just a drinks can. You need something that's going to be <clears throat> the handle. I've got a bit of bamboo, but you could use an old paintbrush. You could use a chopstick. It really doesn't matter. You need some tape to stick it together. I've got some particularly attractive lime green gaffer tape there but you could use masking tape electrician's tape as long as it's sticky um and a pair of scissors maybe a sharp knife and a little bit of sandpaper um so it's stuff that you should have round round the house i've got a cutting mat here and the only thing i would say is that this um is going to be sharp when you cut it. So a couple of plasters handy would be good. I'm hoping not to sever an artery tonight because that would be quite embarrassing. So you can make eight of them out of one can and say if it takes five, ten minutes, I'd be surprised. So all you do is cut the top and the bottom of the can. It does make a nasty noise. So I don't know whether Zoom will cancel this out. No. <laughs> no, sorry. Well, I know because in true Blue Peter fashion, I have got one I've prepared earlier, so I might save you that hideous noise. But you would cut the top and the bottom of the can, then cut sidewards, and you'll end up with basically a flat piece of metal. And as I say, um, that's half a can, and each um, can will make eight. So you would then cut this, in this case, it's into four pieces, and it cuts so easily. Just go careful because it is super sharp. You've then got a flat piece of metal like that, and I've just indicated the sides, and you just need to cut a square out of each side. And if you're thinking, oh, I'll never remember this, um, I, there is a video on my YouTube channel 
with instructions. So if you don't remember but want to have a go, it's all there. So you've ended up with like a very fat capital T and then you just need to bend it in half gently like that. Can you see? Um, we stick it with our handy bits of tape, which I have prepared earlier to our handle. Are you sure you weren't on Blue Peter, Liz? <laughs> I don't think they'd have me. I swear far too much, but I'm on my best behaviour tonight. <laughs> so you want to make sure that's really firm on there because if it fell to pieces while you've got loads of ink on it, it would be upsetting. And then you can just sort of sharpen that fold. And then all we need to do is cut the shape of the nib. And let me just show you, it's basically that shape. So say ordinary scissors, it'll cut ever so easily. At the end here, you might need to cut each side separately just because it's a little bit awkward. So just be careful with those shards. And then if you want to, this is optional, you can just very gently smooth off any sharp edges just with a bit of sandpaper but that is optional. And there you go. And you might think, wow, that was, yeah, all so exciting. Why does she bother doing that? And let me just show you why. Let's hope this one works. I didn't smooth it off, but I think it'll be fine. Basically the ink gets caught in this folded part and just dip it in. I've, this is Indian ink. Now, if I do on the side, you can see how broad that mark is. But if I start to angle it, you can see how thin and fine a mark I can achieve. So we can go from super broad to medium, finer, and then very fine, all with one nib. So it's a really interesting way of working and it'll break up over the paper, you know, like that, because this is just a piece of watercolour paper. So it's great fun. But I mean, if you don't want to use one of those, then, of course, and you've got some of these just ordinary nibs lying around at home, then you can use a variety of width of nibs. Um, I'm sure you haven't got any that will go to sort of centimetre wide, but maybe a calligraphy nib, a round handed nib or something like that. A few different ones you can and you want to have a go at this eagle. Um, you could always use those. But I just love the variety and the expressiveness that we get from this pen. And if you're doing relatively thin mark, it actually goes on for quite a long time before you have to dip again. If you do a thick mark, obviously it runs out a lot quicker. So that wasn't tricky, was it? Literally, say five minutes work. The ink I'm using today is just going to be very bog standard Indian ink. You do need to be careful with the inks you use. So I've got black drawing ink here and I've got Indian ink and they are different. Um, I just swatch those out and I hope you can see the difference. This is Indian ink, so it's really dense and opaque. And this is the drawing ink, which has got a, a far more bluey purple tinge to it. They're both waterproof once they're dry. And it's obviously important if we're going to put washes of watercolour over the top that they are waterproof because otherwise we'll just end up with a hideous muddy mess, which um, again would be a tad upsetting. But drawing ink is not light fast. Um, so with time, it will fade in UV light, whereas Indian ink is light fast. So it's waterproof and UV be resistant and that's terribly important um, when you're doing pen and wash work that you're using a pigmented ink that is light fast. I mean the joy of drawing ink is that you can draw into it with bleach and you can bleach drawing ink um, so that can give you some incredibly beautiful effects but 
it would fade with time. So great for sketchbook work or for illustration work that's going to be reproduced. But if you're displaying, really make sure that you get something that's UV resistant. And I mean, the other lovely thing is that Indian ink is you know, super cheap. Look at the size of that bottle. And I think it cost me, I don't know, four or five pounds. And that will go on an awfully long way. Um, so I love Indian ink. I could drink it for breakfast, but I try and restrain myself. It's wonderful. Um, so let me show you what I would like to work on today. I've printed it out. I found this image of this uh, bald eagle. Um, I was looking for something that might be a bit more native to uh, your neck of the woods. Um, I guess you get buzzards down your way and maybe red kites. Um, hawks. Pardon? Sparrow hawks. Oh, you get sparrow hawks. Mm. Oh, that's good. Um, Anyway, so I, I had actually got as far as finding a couple of sort of a buzzard and and so forth. And then I thought and then I saw this um, bald eagle and I have fallen in love with it. Um, when later on, maybe if we're asking questions, we've got the, my sort of head showing behind me. I've got a painting of this bald eagle. Um, so I thought it would be great fun to do the same subject, but in a different medium. Um, and do, do it in pen and wash. So that's what I'm aiming to do. I'm going to start by with the ink stage. And then obviously I need to let that dry. And then we're going to put washes of watercolour over the top. My sort of approach to pen and wash is that I really want the ink and the watercolour to add up to more than the sum of their parts. So I really don't want a lovely drawing that I then colour in. Equally well, if I started with the watercolour, I don't want a lovely painting that I then outline. And you can start with either medium, you know, depending on the effect you want. But my aim is that the watercolour brings something to the party that's unique and, and the ink brings something to the party and that together we get a sort of two and two equals five. That's what we're, we're aiming for today. And we shall see whether we get there. So I'm just gonna clear all this shards of metal and goodness knows what out of the way for a second. Because that's all a bit of a mess. Only trouble with ink, of course, is that it um, goes everywhere if you spill it. And I once had the joy of, I had a bottle about this size, which I managed to drop in my kitchen. And boy, did that make a mess. And it even went on the ceiling. So uh, I do recommend protecting yourself, protecting surfaces and not dropping 300 millilitres of ink because it really goes a long way. So I have a piece of watercolour paper here that I have sketched my eagle out on and I've kept the lines very light. So you might struggle to see that at the moment, but as soon as I get ink on it, obviously it's gonna be far more visible. Um, this paper is a knot surface. So it's, um, it's got a slight texture to it, but not an awful lot. It's, it's a cotton paper I actually got from, um, sea whites uh, you're very lucky where you are that you're quite handy to go to sea whites um i can't remember the name of the village anyway Green. thank you <laughs> and their lovely factory shop where they got wonderful bargains so i got that from sea whites um and it's it's a nice cotton paper and i would recommend you know if you're doing pen and wash to use obviously a watercolor paper um, a lot of people use a, a hot press surface. Uh, I don't like that because I don't think watercolour behaves very well on it. I, I'm not going in for you know, minute detail on my ink, so I, I don't need that as a surface. But if you are more of a detailed person, you might prefer a hot press surface. But I quite like the extra sort of texture and surprises that are uh, a, a knot surface brings. 
So I've got my Indian ink just in a little pot, which makes it easier to, to dip. And it also makes it far harder for me to spill 300 millilitres. But I could still make a mess with this and possibly I will. And I'm just going to sort of dip that in there and get going. And I'm going to be very bold, I think. So we, I'm going to start with a feather and I'm going to use the uh, sort of shape of the pen to start getting those in. Oh, that's a nicer mark, isn't it? I was just thinking, oh, is this pen not going to behave itself? And then look at the boldness of that. It's just gorgeous. If at any point I go off the top of the camera because I'm concentrating on my picture and not looking at the screen, please tell me and I'll shift my um, painting round, of course. The problem with this breadth of mark is that um, it's wet and it will take a long time to dry. So uh, I need to be super careful of not smudging because I like droplets and splatters, but smudges just look disgusting. So I do need to be careful. Now, I'm not very happy with the way that it's sort of faded out over that, that wing, but I'll be coming and working back in that once it dries a bit. So just getting some of those really dark, heavy marks. It's like getting the, the full stop at the end of the sentence in. You kind of know where you're going. Um, and then, whoops, she said, sorry, sorry, I've just dropped something off the screen. Um, I'm then going to come and start working on this head. And I am not going to put a line around the top of the eagle's head because as I say I want there to be place for the the watercolour to do some work and that the light is coming this direction so the watercolour can really sort of help there and I'm doing some sort of continuous line to indicate the feathers where the white I wonder if I can be good and have that on screen for you I just sort of pop that there. I'll have to move it at some point. Um, and if you want this reference, it comes from pixabay.com. So I can always send the, the reference. So it's royalty free. Um, and I love Pixabay as a place to find good reference photos. So again, I'm just coming with some variety of marks just in its chest area as well just to start developing those but I'm aiming constantly to uh, have a variety of marks some are continuous some are fine some are bold and that just adds a real visual interest for the viewer rather than everything being very uniform, which is, of course, what you get with sort of micron pens. Terribly controllable, you know, very, very usable, um, but just a little bit boring, might I suggest? I, I mean, I do use them all the time, but, but just, you know, they don't bring a lot to the party. Terribly dependable. They'll go on until the cows come home or well they, they run out of ink and then that's it but you know you could do so much more perhaps so I'm just getting some of those marks in and I'll come back to it but I quite like to work on the whole of the the drawing side of things before I get too caught up in detail or one particular area, because it can be very easy to get caught up and overdevelop an area. And then sort of everything's got out of kilter and out of balance. So again, I was just repeating some of that continuous line work on the sort of feather shapes of, of the bird's body. And 
if you don't like the sound of chalk scratching on a blackboard or something like that, I'm afraid this might be slightly torturous for you. And I do apologize. It can get all a bit scratchy, but I think the effects and, the, and it's, it's worth that slight agony of, of the noise. And you just have to learn to sort of blank it out, I'm afraid. I just asked Jackie, did you put your hand up to ask a question? No. If no. you could just unmute yourself and ask a question, Jackie, if you need to. Yeah. And please do ask as I go along. No, I didn't. I didn't. I don't know what's going on with my iPad. It just <laughs> came up. I they didn't have a life even of their own. That. I know. Apologies. No problem. Uh, <laughs> Technology is a marvellous and wonderful thing when it behaves itself, um, but when it gets a mind of its own, it's going to be very scary. So you can just see I'm, I'm sort of going a little heavier with some of those marks down into this leg and into sort of pantaloons. Um, and I'm not going to get too carried away with that because uh, I say the danger is of overdeveloping one area but I'm so looking forward to coming down to these talons. Um, I think birds' feet are absolutely amazing. We, we used to keep chickens and you look at their feet and you realize just how close they are to sort of reptiles. And once, once you look at a, a bird's foot, you can sort of see that um, sort of history to it or, you know, you see where, that they were related to pterodactyls somewhere. So again, I'm, I'm altering and changing those marks and the quality of the marks so that I've got this variety and then I can have great fun with those talons. You wouldn't want those coming for you, would you? If you were some, I don't know what to, bald eagles eat fish, I think, don't they? Um, mm -hmm anything they fancied I would imagine but um so I'm um, again a, a little continuous line and I hope you can see that I'm altering the shape uh, uh, sorry the direction and the angle that I'm holding this at so partly I am using the breadth of the line to indicate tone and partly I will do some of that work with, with the watercolour when, when we get to that stage. You could do a lot more of the, of the work. You know, it's, it's really a matter of choice, whether you want the ink to do more of the work. Um, so I'm just looking at the length of this foot. That comes a bit further. So you know, do you want the ink to do the work? Do you want the watercolour to do more of the work? And that's a real personal choice. Um, I think the, in this, the ink is going to be doing loads of the work. So actually, by the time we get to the watercolour, it will be a case of, of the washes going on very quickly if, if this goes to plan, which I'm certainly hoping it does. Always embarrassing if your painting doesn't go to platinum in public, isn't it? So, we have a question, Liz. Um, Christine's asking, does the sharp nib scratch the paper and will this affect how the watercolour goes on in due course? No, it doesn't actually. Um, I mean, it is a scratchy process, but it doesn't physically um, impact the paper. I'm holding it quite gently. I'm not gouging it in because this is so thin, because it is just a drinks can. Um, let me find a different one rather than destroying the one that, you know, if I bend it like that, can you see, you know, it's bent. So if you press too hard, you will bend and break the nib. And they, they don't last very long, but, you've made eight out of your drinks can, so you've got plenty. So you shouldn't press it too hard because you will just bend the nib and, and sort of break it. Um, you know, once they're broken, they're broken, bung them in your recycling and, and make another one. So no, I've never had problems with damaging the paper um, or with the watercolor then not behaving itself. 
so, but that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about that, but no, not at all. I don't know if you spotted that. I had a little splat here. Um, so you will find that the occasionally the nib will almost catch the paper and you might end up with a little splat of, of ink. Um, I have no issue with that. I actually thoroughly enjoy a good splatter, but um, there are ways and means of disguising if you end up with splats in places and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to see that later. So a dip pen, say, it brings a lot of character and interest, but it brings a lot less control than if you were using a micron pen. It, it's a muckier process, but you might end up with the happy accident, something you weren't expecting, or something that you have to control and work your way around a little problem it's presented you. But I don't think that's any bad thing. I think um, being ready to release some control for the joy that you might get is, is a good thing. Now, I am going dark here, even though it is a white, it has a white tail, I'm going to use some of that um, just to create form. Uh, because I want to basically. I'd like. So you can see it's quite a, a fast process and I'm going to come back because most of this is dry now. I need to be careful here. And if you are concerned about it smudging, a little bit of kitchen towel to rest your hand on to stop yourself smudging would be a good idea because to say smudges are just plain ugly. Uh, again, if we get smudges, we'll just have to deal with it. Oops, this pen's decided not to play ball now. That's better. It's just off uh, the top of the screen at the minute. Liz. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Oh, yeah, let me just move that down. It's lovely. There, do apologize. It wasn't very exciting up there, so <laughs> you didn't miss anything, but yes, thank you. So I've, I've those, nice big exclamation mark sort of marks that I did at the beginning I want to work into and integrate and sort shapes out because but I am just watching what's going on down here perhaps I should pull my jumper up so I don't get ink everywhere I might just want to start to um work into those and get some detail as well. So these are the, we've got the, the, the flight feathers here. We've got the secondary feathers here. I'm just working into the, the sort of covers um, because the wing is very, very structured and amazing to, to look at. So I'm not an ornithologist and I don't want this to be sort of this in no way is a zoological sort of study of this amazing bird, but I do want it to be plausible that if a, an ornithologist looked at it, they wouldn't be deeply offended by the lack of, I don't know, flight feathers or something. Or, you know, I don't want to make some hideous ornithological faux pas. But my aim is to interpret uh, and and to get the essence of this amazing bird rather than to worry about the actual, um, you know, has it got 12 tail feathers or 11? I, I really don't care. It cares, I don't. So um, now I'm going doing a little bit of disguising work here because I didn't like those smudgy marks. So I'm, I'm sort of using some of the lines to hopefully distract and disguise. And I think, you know, as an artist, you you, you are a problem solver. You, you do something and particularly with watercolor, you know, it, it can be a bit like herding cats. It can 
be quite unexpected if you're you know you let the water do its own thing or, or whatever so to to learn to interpret and use the marks that you achieve to get to the effect that you want is is one of our sort of skills I hope I'm just looking at the ends here uh, they're all very sort of square uh, on and not all of the feathers are so some of them are a little bit more pointed so again just grabbing a little bit of detail at the end and and altering those I think is a good idea and then working into that wing I'm going to bring that like that to sort of form the, the quill it down the center of some of these. And again, just looking at directions. So you find that flight feathers sort of come out a bit like fingers and then the secondary feathers down here tend to come in a little more parallel. So we just need to be aware of that rather than necessarily worrying you know too much i'm going to have a different quality of mark there oh i went off the top again didn't i okay. so there you go again i think that's probably enough on that wing because i'm i'm in danger of over developing that before i get round to this wing so over here, and let me just do that so you can see, I'm going to again just come into the ends and try and be very bold. I'm going to hold this down near the end. Just off the picture again, Liz. Uh, I have pulled it down, but there it is. It. Yeah. Right, so just pulling that in. I'm getting a slightly different mark to the one we had before. So it's all, this is like a sampler of mark making. I'm going to try not to get as much smudginess on these ones. because So you learn as you go along and you think, mm, not that happy with that mark. Let's try something different um, rather than doing the same thing. So here, again, quite a bold mark, but I'm going to try and indicate a feathery edge and then I'm coming down here just looking where we're going here um, so the wing ooh, and you see I've got a splot there but I'm going to live with that I'm not going to panic and the, the great thing is that one drop like that will look like I've made a mistake by the time I've put a few up here and a few down there they will look entirely intentional so um, it's all about just enjoying the medium and letting the medium do its thing rather than trying to control it, just trying to play to its strengths. So again, I've got a lot of fluid on here. I need to be very careful. So rather than adding more, I'm going to come up to the, the cover feathers here and maybe work slightly more in that continuous line again so I've got a nice contrast and then these there's lovely I don't know what oh, I'm trying to remember what this feather is that sort of sticks out like a thumb can't remember what it's called I should know that I can't remember. Anyway, that one is one of my favourite feathers. I've got another question, Liz. Yes. Um, Tricia, who I think maybe came in slightly after, do you ever draw in pencil prior to using the inks? Absolutely, yes. If you look closely, I've got the pencil lines um, there because if, if I'm doing something like urban sketching, so I'm drawing from life outside, 
I think it's a really, really good discipline to just go straight in with pen. Um, it makes you utterly committed to your mark because you haven't got an eraser. You know you, you've got to, to work with what's on that paper. So say I was sketching our ducks down at the lake or something as well. I quite often will just use a pen and go in um, and be really bold and say and committed. It makes you really look at what you're you're doing and um, thinking about your marks. But on something like this, if I didn't um, have some sort of guidelines, especially when you're doing a demonstration, we could end up with this eagle looking like a pterodactyl. And um, yes, that wouldn't be great, would it? So. A little, a little guideline just gives, make sure I get his proportions vaguely, vaguely right that he could potentially fly because, you know, certainly doing a bird, you want him to look plausibly airborne. So I'm just coming round here. This pen is not behaving itself today. Ah, oh, that's better. So these are not perfect instruments, you know, for goodness sakes, they are made out of your recycling. So it will misbehave on occasions and you will get those splats. Uh, um, but as I say, I think for the energy that it brings, it's uh, well worth doing. Now, I'm just going to find that bit of kitchen towel and try and wick away a little of that moisture because that is going to take forever to dry if I'm not careful. I have got a little smudge down here and I have another droplet there. So I'm just managing the amount of liquid on the surface. But I'm, I'm not unhappy with any of those. So it, it's fine. We can integrate those and make them part of the style. Of, of the piece, but I'm aware of how much is there because I don't want you to be watching this dry at midnight. Um, and I'm sure you don't want to be watching this dry at midnight either, so. Well, we're on mute, so you wouldn't hear too much snoring. <laughs> just, yes, I'd just look up, I'd be like doodling away, happy, happy, and I'd look up and there'd just be this blank screen <laughs> or of people slumped in chairs. It's like, anyway, I'm hoping that's not going to be the case. No. Good, thank you. <laughs> oh, dear. So, and again, just bearing some of those marks. I was feeling that these were becoming a little repetitive. I don't want them to look like piano keys. Um, so again, bearing those marks and scratching away. Need to be careful I don't go over his wonderful beak. So I'm, I will leave some of that area a little less resolved and we'll come back to that because the joy of doing pen and wash work is of course you can put the ink on let it dry put watercolor on let it dry come back add more ink add more watercolor so that um it's always best to stop far too soon rather than too late because you can add more so easily but what you can't do, and I'm just going to swap pens because that one is starting to annoy me. Let's see if this one is going to behave itself better. Yes, what you can't do is take it off. Well, you know, once, oh, that's better. Look, this one's behaving itself. Um, once the ink is on the surface, tough. There, you know, we don't have any option of, of erasing it. So this is not for the faint hearted, but in the end, it is only a piece of paper, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's not like you've done this on some gessoed panel that's taken you sort of 13 layers of preparation. 
you know, worst comes to the worst, we turn it over, we start again, or we put it in the recycling bin. So I think a little spirit of adventure and boldness is no bad thing. Um, that's what I say anyway. So I'm just, what I'm doing here is just sorting out again, some of the shapes of the ends of these feathers so that they're not too square. And trying to sort out a little of this sort of smudgy mark that I got earlier that I'm not overly fond of. I, say, I don't think it's so bad that I'm at the despair stage. Now these smudges down here that I did, despite all my protestations, I did manage to smudge some of which I think can be slightly disguised by a few lines and some of which I'm going to have to do something else with, but, but that's fine. Uh, ba -da -ba -da. Right, just looking at where this comes into the body and you've got sort of the underwing here. I think I will use the watercolour to achieve some of that. And just make sure that's correct. And even though I have got my drawing with the pencil there, I do always check proportions as I go along because let's be honest, you know, sometimes we draw things and we don't do them terribly well. Um, so to always be double checking proportions and directions and angles is no bad thing. The other thing, of course, is to always try and draw ahead of time so that you, your eyes are rested. And when you come back and look at your underdrawing and your proportions, if something has gone astray, you actually see it. The danger is we see what we, we kind of think. You know, I look at this and I see what I meant to draw rather than what I actually did draw. Um, let's just come down a little. Um, I just wanted to work on some of these shapes here. Well, I'm always sort of trying to challenge myself and see what I've done and whether it, it makes sort of sense um, and not getting too carried away. Sorry. What was the pen seems to work better in one direction than another. Does that just vary with each one that you make? Yes, each pen is really unique. So some behave themselves. So this one is behaving really nicely and I can get a lovely fine controlled line like I'm doing here. Whereas that other one was starting to be a bit naughty and I was getting cross with it. So uh, hence, hence the, the change, but this one seems to be quite nice at the moment. Um, and again, I'm right handed, left handed people tend to draw, um, they tend to push the pen rather than pull it. So they will find you will, I mean, of course, it will work for you, but you will find it a different experience. And of course, if you were left handed, it would make sense to start on the right hand of your piece and then probably work this direction to minimize those that smudging, for example, um, and just to, to work that process out to, to minimize sort of going over any, any of your work, just putting a few very fine. Oops, we are frozen, or have I frozen? Just to get that little division there. Um, a lot of, sorry, pardon? Oh, sorry. I think it's my internet connection's gone a bit funny. Oh, right, okay, sorry. I I, I thought you said I'd frozen and I was like, oh, I'm. Well, I wasn't sure who it was, but I think it was mine. Oh, good, in, in the nicest possible way. <laughs> um, what's this saying? Yeah, uh, blah, blah, blah. 
Oh, I've lost. Oh, yes, I should say I wasn't going to do any cross hatching. Um, in line and wash, you can, of course, develop a lot of tone with the sort of density of your lines through cross hatching or single hatching and so forth. Um, again, I don't, in this particular piece, I don't want to do that. And with this pen, it's not a strength of the pen to do that sort of very controlled cross hatching. If you wanted to do that, I would probably use uh, a dip pen with a, a metal nib um, and you could get a far finer line that's far more controlled. The strength of this pen is, is the boldness of it, you know, because we we almost got the whole of the, the eagle going on here. Um, and it's, I think it's suited for birds of prey. I think this is a lovely way because it's so strong and it just captures some of their energy and strength. I just want to get this feather at the top with a little bit more detail coming off because it's quite a raggedy one, this little flight feather. There we go. Okay. The only area I'm not happy with at the this moment is here. I didn't like that smudgy sort of look. So I'm just going to come in and sort some of that out. And then I think I need to dry this ink, which won't take long because most of it's pretty dry. Um, and then we can think about watercolour. I am wondering, because it's 20 past eight now, and you said that you usually took a break halfway, I, we could break, I could get the ink dry, so you yeah. don't have to listen to my hairdryer because that's obviously not the most thrilling noise in the world. Um, and then we could come back and get some watercolour on. Does that sound like a, a plan? Yeah, that sounds good. So if everybody wants to take, what, 10 minutes, Liz, is that okay? Yes, I think so. So um, say my and I promise I won't fiddle or do anything terribly exciting while you're not watching. Um, I'm just so if, if we aim everyone back about half past. Um, and if you want to unmute yourselves and have a chat in the meantime, please do. Um, while Liz gets her ink dry. Okay, and I will mute myself so that you don't need to listen to the hairdryer. But before I go, are there any other questions of this sort of how we've got to this stage so far? Do unmute yourselves to ask if you want to. No? No, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Either we all stunned into silence or I've explained it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's lovely. Right. Okay, we'll see you in a few minutes. Yes, indeedy. So everybody unmute if they'd like to and have a chat. Normal coffee break stuff. And thanks to everybody as well at the exhibition who was doing stewarding and helping with the um, take in and the hanging and the takedown yesterday as well. We had some really good teamwork and it just went really smoothly and was done, I think, pretty quickly, which was lovely. So thanks, everybody, for that. And um, anybody's got anything they want to have a chat about, please go ahead. You're not normally this quiet in the coffee break. Come on. <laughs> Well, there's no one saying anything. Uh, we were talking about, uh, um, Liz just talked about uh, the um, connection of uh, birds and pterodactyls mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. Um, and uh, in fact, of course, they, they did, birds do, uh, ev did evolve from uh, reptiles, but they, uh, they are believed now to have evolved from uh, therapsid uh, dinosaurs. 
In other words, uh, dinosaurs of the same uh, vintage of uh, the same ilk as, uh, yeah. uh, believe it or not, uh, Tyrannosaurus. Okay, I'm back. So when you actually see a blackbird hopping yeah. around the uh, around the lawn, it's uh, upright in exactly the same way, and its ancestors were uh, upright as well, uh, as uh, indeed uh, Tyrannosaurus and its ancestors were uh, upright, and so they evolved uh, from those uh, upright uh, um, hopping or uh, um, um, walking uh, dinosaurs which then uh, managed to uh, get the ability to uh, fly. And it's thought that many of the smaller dinosaurs had uh, wings um, or at least uh, had feathers in order to uh, keep them warm, warm. So uh, the, they evolved the warm bloodedness um, before uh, the, um, they became uh, actually active uh, flyers. So it's a, it's a very, a very kind of uh, ongoing uh, area because there are some uh, fantastic fossils uh, coming out of uh, China, as well as the um, original Archaeopteryx from uh, um, Bavaria, which uh, showed the very first uh, dinosaur uh, come uh, bird uh, uh, in action, as it were, or at least in uh, somewhat frozen action after uh, 150 million years or so. Wow, brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm pretty relieved not to look out of my window and see a T-Rex on the lawn, but happy with the blackbird. Well, uh, indeed, indeed, <laughs> indeed. However, a Dorking uh, Group of Artists Committee meetings. Hmm. <laughs> I won't, say, I, I won't say anything further. Good. Really? Stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering if she was still listening. I, yes, I am listening, Nick. I can hear everything you're saying. And can I just say how delightful it is to have another lecture of a sort coming from your extensive knowledge. It just happens to be one of my interests. <laughs> right. As a, something of a birder. Yeah. Jane, I'm, in, I'm intrigued now about the committee meetings. Yeah, so am I. I don't think it was the same committee meeting I was at. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> Can I just say, Fiona, I thought the exhibition was hung beautifully. Oh, thank you, Jane. I That's thought it looked really good. It all kind of hung together. It all looked very good. Well, on the walls. As I say, it was teamwork. We had a, a really good little team doing it, and I said my thanks to all of them. And yeah, I think I was pleased with it. I thought it looked very good. They did an excellent job. So yeah, yeah, it looked uh, it looked appreciably better than in, in past years. I just thought it was it had um, up the ante a bit, which was wonderful. Lovely, thank you. Yeah. I think good it too. helped a little bit as well. We we had hundred and three on the wall this year. Um, whereas we often have 120, 130. So obviously with those extra, it, it does mean having to get, you know, get them a little bit closer. And I think having that bit of space was actually quite nice for the paintings. It gives them a little breathe, bit of breathing space, you know. Indeed. So. Yeah, indeed. But um, thank you. So we had a lot of people that came around looking said, you know, they may not have bought anything, but they did say that they really enjoyed it and it was a lovely exhibition. So everybody should be really proud of their work and their contribution to it. Thank you. So. Yeah, good. Definitely. So I guess somebody else has been in there today, hanging their paintings. One lot out, the next lot in, the next day. Uh, we should just wait for next year and have the excitement all over again. Do you usually go to Denby's? Yes. Yeah. It's a lovely space, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's very nice. Yes, we're normally, uh, well, I don't remember since I've been with North Weald, which is not as long as a lot of people I know, but I don't think I've known an exhibition of North Weald anywhere other than Denby's. Um, mm. I don't know if Ruth or Alan, oh, Alan's disappeared for a minute, but do you know if it was held anywhere else before Ruth? Um, yeah, so we used to have an exhibition in the Samaritans Hall in Rygate. Oh. Um, uh, that uh, no, you do we, because you have to go up a sort of a, a sort of narrow passage between two buildings. Um, it's, it wasn't terribly accessible. It wasn't very well supported. Hmm. But there's nowhere in Rygate really you can put on an exhibition. It used to be in the town hall. 
Ruth, Miss Smith Town Hall, where the cafe is now on the top store. <laughs> that's be that's before my time, Hilary. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it well, but the stairs are always a bit of a bind for people because there's you get up there, but it's really, it was always very successful there. And then the um and then Rygate decided they wanted a lot of work done to the hall, uh, to the room up there, so they had yeah. to move when they went to um, Samaritans and then to Denby's. Yeah. So were you a member of Rygate Society of Artists then, Hilary? No, I was a member of the North Wheel. North Wheel had their yeah. Yeah, exhibition there. Yeah. No, there's always North Wheel there. But it's a shame they, when they, the, 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 so Rygate decided that the, the town hall needed a lot of work done yeah. to the top there, and so it, they shut it. Mm. And then it's a cafe. I don't, I don't know if it's in the use as a cafe still. Yeah, the, that's where they, was, the Rotary had their exhibition in that top um, room of the of, of the old town hall. But oh, you can only have it for because it's a cafe. You can only really have it for a weekend. Oh right. And, and space is quite limited as well. Mm. It, was, so. it was completely empty. You see, before it was, it was before the cafe was yes. there. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I don't, but it wanted so much work done to it. Then it became a cafe. So this is the trouble. Is the exhibition space is rather limited <laughs> around here, except for Denbys, really. Yeah, mm. it's a shame, really, that there are so few spaces mm. around. But uh, anyway, oh, well. great for the Denbys. Sussex artists. We normally have exhibition at in Horsham at the um, the hall there, and that needs a lot of work. And it's also in the process of being sold to the British Legion. And we're hoping that they will allow us to use that again. So anyone in Sussex, do enter the exhibition. Um, contact me if you need information. I know most of you are in Surrey. But um, we've been looking around just to check out, you know, for plan B and plan C, mm -hmm. if the drill hall isn't available, where else we can go. And it's so difficult finding anywhere that's suitable, that's big enough, that's available. Um, schools are sometimes an option because that exhibition tends to be in August when the children are on holiday, but then they they let the halls out to people, you know, in the evenings on a regular booking. So that means it's not available for the exhibition. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's a challenge finding places for mm -hmm. exhibitions, as you say, very difficult. Which is why Denbys is booked up, you know, fairly solid, two three more years ahead. Yeah, and expensive, but. Um, Everywhere is expensive these days, to be honest. So that's no different, really. Uh, yeah. So we're waiting for Alan, who's not at his chair at the moment, but um, we got most other people back. Oh, let's have a look through the gallery. I'm back. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I think most people look, of people that have got their cameras on, most people look to be back. So, um, Liz, okay. ready? If you'd like to let us know, then yeah, can, I'm here. So yes, if we're happy to keep going. Yes, yeah. Lovely. Okay. So what I did while you while you were all having cups of tea or glasses of wine, which sounded very nice for a Monday evening, I was drying this. Um, and now's a good time to get rid of any pencil lines you don't want. It is sensible just to be quite cautious, just in case you haven't managed to dry the whole thing, just so that you don't end up sort of catching a wet patch and um, smudging it. But say this this is a good point to, to get shot of any lines that you, you don't want. I'm not going to get rid of all those at this point because just watching me go around with the rubber is not going to be terribly interesting for you. But that's what I would do. Um, and I say, don't, you know, if there's more ink that you want to put on, that's fine, it can always be done, but far, far better to stop at about 90%. If you think, oh, I'm 90% of the way to where I want to be, stop, because actually by the time you put your watercolour on, you may realise that you were actually at 100% anyway, or, you know, you can always add some more. So... I have mixed up some watercolours and let me tell you which colours I've got. I've, so I've got them in a just a little daisy wheel palette. Um, I've got some gamboge here, some quinacrinone gold, 
Um, I, this is quinacrinone sienna or burnt sienna would be lovely. This is a transparent grey. Uh, that's a fallow blue and that's a cobalt blue deep. Um, I've just started to, to mix up a sort of dark brownie mush in, in the middle. Um, I personally really like using a daisy wheel palette because it forces you to plan your colours. The danger of using a paint box with 24 colours in or 48, even worse, is that you decide to use every single colour in your work and it becomes this orgy of colour. Um, but if you actually plan your colours with, say, well, your maximum, you know, seven, eight colours, you've still got an infinite variety of mixtures available with, within that um, sort of selection. So I, I think it tends to bring far more cohesion to your work. Um, I like tube colours because you can mix up lovely big creamy washes very quickly, but of course, you know, if you're working on a smaller scale or you're outside, then pans are, are the way to go. Um, off screen, I've got a couple of pots of water. I've got a piece of kitchen towel. And, and as we all know, the, the secret with watercolour is to, to control the water um, rather than control the paint. So I'm going to start on this wonderful beak and I'm using a bit of the gamboge there. And having said that I don't want to just colour in, if, if uh, you know, like I said at the beginning, um, I am actually being very careful on the beak because the beak is really sharp. It's, you know, hard, it's, it's for hunting. It needs to be precise. It doesn't need a sort of fuzzy edge but I'm going to take that colour back to where the eye is and take the colour back in to, I know this is a white head, but the, when you're painting a white subject in watercolour, you need, well, in anything, forget just watercolour, you're looking for, is it a creamy white? Is it a yellowy white? Is it a pinky white? Is it a bluey white? What, what sort of white is it? Where's the whitest white? which of course is on the top of the head here, where, you know, what colours are in the, the shadow areas? How can I achieve a white subject on white paper with no white paint? So I'm just coming back in with some of that Quinn Gold. I'm using, this is about a size, yes, size eight round brush. Um, again, I would usually use a bigger brush, but because I am actually trying to be a little more precise here, I'm using quite a small um, brush just to bring some of that color into the head. So that can dry in peace, I'm gonna come down to these wonderful talons. And again, these need to be relatively precise but I want to leave some white areas to show where the light's hitting. And you can see how quick this is to do um, because our pen work has done, you know, all the hard work for us. So, so here I'm being a little bit looser. I'm, I'm ignoring a few of the lines. I'm creating edges and, and lines as, as needs be, I need to look at the thickness of those talons. They are, you know, these are chunky. I say you wouldn't want these coming at you. Um, but that just brings in some of that um, sort of color down there. And then I'm looking at the tail. And again, the tail, though it is white as such, it is absolutely a yellowy white. Now, the danger again is always that you've got a brush in your hand, so you jolly well carry on painting with it because you kind of forget. Um, so I need to go to a larger brush. If you're aiming to paint pretty loosely, uh, using a brush that feels a little uncomfortable, a little bit too big. Oh, that's interesting. My ink was obviously still a little bit wet there, so I've got a little bit of ink moving. But actually, 
I quite like that, how that sort of mixes into the watercolour, but I just need to be careful. I didn't get any ink moving here, but um, I obviously haven't quite dried that. And you will find different um, papers dry at different rates and an ink might be waterproof on one paper, but when you use it on another, it, it actually moves a bit. So paper really interacts with the, the ink and you need to try it out, your particular combination. Don't just assume because the bottle says it's waterproof that it will be. Um, your, your paper will have a huge effect on it. So I've just brought that tail in and, and created those um, areas. The sensible thing to do would be to work on this left wing here, because then I can move to this, this right wing again without that smudging. But I'm conscious that that beak is really wet. So if I do the this behind, I could end up with it all running into each other. So I am going to work on this right hand um, wing. Before I printed this out, I did really enhance the colours. I mean, I could see from the photo that, yes, this is a brown, blacky brown bird with a white head and a white tail, yellow feet. But by enhancing the colours, it, it helped me really see the amounts of blues and browns in there so that I can sort of um, really sort of pull that out in my painting. So it's nice sometimes to use a bit of technology to, to help you. If you can't see those colours, then do use technology to your, your advantage. So here I'm using the shape of my brush and I'm just going off the top, I bet. You're just about to tell me that. Um, so that, yes, I've got the lines there, but I'm adding to the shape of it with my brushwork. And this is what I was saying about trying to make two and two equal five, um, that the watercolour has something to bring to the party. And I'm mixing in some of that um, cobalt blue with this sort of mix that I've got in the middle, which was a little bit of the grey, a little bit of the burnt sienna, a little bit of the blue, a bit of a sort of mushy mix. And I'm bringing that in, but with little flashes of, of the blue and the sienna, hopefully showing through. And the joy of mixing your colours on the paper is that you do get that sort of infinite variety. And I'm just using a little spray bottle here, it's just got water in, to soften some of those edges and just getting a little bit of flow and movement. It brings another random mark. So I want some hard edges like I've got here and then some soft edges elsewhere. And again, it's I'm letting go of that control, which can be scary, but can be brilliant fun too. I'm taking quite a lot of blue down here just because I feel like it and I haven't used any of my little fallow blue. So let's bring a different one in there. And just some of that color through. That possibly is a little garish, but again, maybe we can live with some of that. Okay, so I'm happy with how that's going. I'm just looking if there are any edges that need softening while they're wet quite like it being lighter in the middle. So we've got the feeling of the light hitting that wing. I might just soften that a little bit more and let some of that color, can you see it's just going off for a little wander on its own. And I just love watercolor because it gives you these little marks and wonders if you let the water do its thing and you, you relinquish that control. So I think I need to come down to this body now. 
again, I've got that, that mix and I'm going to use my larger brush and just get some feathery marks through that body. So that's a round brush that you're using, Liz. It is just a round brush that's about a size 16. I mean, it's actually a quill brush, but equivalent. So it comes to a really decent point. Again, let me just put that against my really nice point, but it's got a really good holding capacity. It's just um, Jackson's, yeah, Jackson's quill, um, but nice, nice brush. So it puts up with quite a lot of abuse, which is good. Um, in a way that, you know, a sable just wouldn't. So I've mixed in a little bit of yellow blue, which is mixing nicely through and just coming down. And we need, like, so again, I'm just bearing those marks. Um, the legs themselves are not overly interesting let's be honest um, we're not paying a huge amount of attention to them so I'm not going to draw attention to them you know we're, we're terribly interested in the talons on the ends because those are fascinating but the actual sort of legs themselves aren't that interesting so again just not paying that much attention in terms of detail I'm putting a little yellow just on the front of the legs because the light is sort of hitting them and I think that's quite fun and I'm going to just sort of pull that across but leaving some little flashes of white because always the white of the, the paper does bring the watercolour to life whoops and that pen is going for a roll and I just like to soften off the back of the, the legs so I'm again using my little spray brush, uh, spray bro bottle, just to soften off some of that. So I'm taking the watercolour outside of some of the lines, inside some of the lines, where I think it will enhance that. And your surface there, Liz, is that completely flat rather than at an angle? It is at the moment. Usually I would paint at a slight angle. But just for, for film wise, um, as you sort of saw, I, I have enough issues with technology without having to sort out angles and things. So, so um, if, if I were painting just in the studio, I would have my work uh, at a slight angle because that just helps you predict what the water's going to do you know it will flow downhill whereas when it's flat like this it was kind of flowing uphill almost when when I came off the top of the um wing you know um, and it is pooling in a few places so that would just be helped if if I was at an angle but I thought usually when you're sort of working with an overhead thing it's it's better not to she just looking at the top of this wing. I really like the pattern that's going on here. And I like that it's light here. So I'm going to, while it's just damp, I carefully come round and emphasize, I think, some of that, that shape and just capture the light on the, on the corner of that wing. It's, I'm sorry, it's not a corner, but you, you know what I mean by, and then maybe put in a little bit of that blue, just, just behind. So often when you're painting loosely, people kind of assume that you are just sort of slapping the paint on, but then it's, uh, you want to contrast areas of control with the areas that you, have loosened your control. I'm going back in and dropping in some of that Quin Gold into the body to mix on the, on the surface. And I'm rather liking how that is mixing in. I think that's fine. So we've now got this um, area 
And again, I need to look at what is still wet and therefore what might run and what is, is dry. So my beak here is almost dry, but not quite. So just while it is drying a tiddy bit more, I'm just gonna come back in round the eye carefully. I'm gonna balance, sorry, with my little finger, just keep, keep my brush off the surface. Uh, sorry, not my brush, my hand off the surface. I know you can't see because it's my hands in the way, but what I'm doing is just darkening slightly under that brow bone of the, the eagle. I want that really intense look, you know, it's spied something juicy that it's really after. And I want that sort of look of intent. So I'm just deepening that shadow there at the moment. Good. I'm going to give this just a very like a five second blast with the hairdryer just to dry that because I say the last thing I want is paint going into the, the beak area. So just excuse me for five seconds. There you go. See, that wasn't too bad, I hope. Um, I much prefer to let watercolour dry naturally. I find that it dulls and just takes a little bit of the transparency off if you, you hair dryer it too much. But equally well, there are times when you've just got to for, for managing your, your workload and, and what the paint is doing. But if I can allow things to dry naturally and to, to move and to um, do its thing, then I'm, I'm usually a lot happier. Just going to mix up more of um, my sort of gungy brown colour, which was my burnt sienna, my transparent grey, and a little touch of that cobalt blue, just to get a good, interesting mix going on there. And it's always worth mixing a bit more than you anticipate you will need because it's inevitable that you will run out halfway through. You'll need to stop and mix it and potentially end up with hard edges where you don't want them. I mean, in this style of painting, it really doesn't matter because it's all so wet and wet and I'm not... Um, Do you want to really... move it down slightly, Liz? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just taking those top feathers. That's all I'm doing. Um, and again, just coming out slightly out of the, um, the line. I may have gone a little bit dark with this one. So I can always lift off a bit if I want. And just introducing a little bit more of that blue. I'm looking at the shape of my feathers and the ends of them because the flight feathers on the end are more pointed and they become flatter and rounder as they come into the secondaries. So as said, you know, this isn't meant to be an ornithological study, but I do want it to be plausible. I did hear, sorry, I overheard someone chatting and say that they're a bit of a birder. So um, someone here probably knows an awful lot more than I. Um, and possibly is rolling their eyes at the moment. I hope not, but uh, they can tell me what this this feather here is called. Perhaps it's something like an avula feather. I can't remember. It's something like that. Um, I'll look it up when we finish and commit it to memory. So I'm doing the the covers there. Um, but this wing is further away, yes, so I want more, pardon? Sorry, yeah, I was just saying, uh, I'm certainly not rolling up the eyes, I think it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Birda, that's very kind. 
I say, I, I'm, you know, when you're trying to get the, the sort of the essence of the bird rather than the, the detail, it, as you do want it to look like it could fly. So I'm spraying with water here in the hope that some of this colour will go for a little bit of a wander. Now it's not quite doing what I'm hoping, so I need to encourage it. But I wanted it to walk a little bit further up here. Um, Watercolour can be like herding cats. Now I'm coming round the top of the head and this is important to get right because that is a really crisp edge and the wing behind is what defines that white head that's catching the light. So we need to make sure that is right. And of course, we see everything by contrast. So the head will look whiter if it is darker behind. Um, so it's worth getting that really dark behind to really throw that head forward. I'm still using my big brush um, because it's got that lovely point on it. And, you know, you can get a lot of detail going on without resorting to a size zero, zero, zero brush. Um, small brushes give us the illusion of control, but they can make our work really tight and um, overly controlled. So I just brushed down here. Let me just see if I can pull that up and did a little sort of dry brushing and let it break over the surface. This paper is relatively smooth for, for a, um, a hot press, no, sorry, not a hot press, a cold press surface. So I'm not getting much texture coming through, but luckily it did there. And I'll just drop a bit of some of that um, fallow blue in. I'm coming back here because it was looked a bit outlined. So let's just pull some of that through. Right. And now, so we know we want to keep that hard here. And I wanted to have some softer edges there to, to imply movement. I also want to have some softer edges over here to imply the flap and the, the movement of that wing. So I've sprayed, and again, I hope you can see if I've just moved that over, that we've got just some little wafts of colour coming off, which is what I wanted. So, and I want a little to go that direction. It's just a way of implying a bit of movement because though this bird is coming in to grab something it's a, it's about to stall almost um i do want that sort of sense of momentum so i've got soft edges here i've got some softer edges up there and again i think maybe down here just at the bottom of this wing i may have left it a little bit too late so i'll use a clean brush just to sort of tickle it and just to get some of that colour to go for a little walk. I think that will do there. Right. So you saw how quick that was. I mean, how long has that taken? We came back, so that's taken what, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes maybe to get sort of the colour on because the the paint had done so much of that hard work which was great not the paint sorry the ink gosh it's the evening and that's how my words are going what I would like to do is get this dry because now I'm looking at it and it's a this is the point of where we want to balance things and I would say right where does this need more detail and I do wonder I, I like the, the blankness of this area on its head, so that's fine. I might want a few finer marks round its eye, I think. 
I quite like that that is fairly empty because I don't want it to distract. Um, but I'm thinking that maybe a few more marks up here wouldn't be a bad thing. And maybe again, just a little bit round this end of the tail is probably what I'd want to do. So you're always looking for balance and you're, you're thinking, right, what's worked? What bit do I like? And what bit don't I like? And if I don't like it, how can I disguise it? I'm gonna pull off a little bit of this color. It feels a little heavy through the body. So just with a, a bit of tissue and that involves um, or, or introduces a little bit of texture, which I like. I am wondering if this blue here is a little bit strong. So again, I might just pull off a tiny bit. I know it's going to get lighter as it dries, but I'm just in that managing, right, what's going on here sort of situation. I've got quite a puddle going on here. I like the mark it's making, but for time, I need to just manage that. And then you're looking and balancing. You remember I got my, I here are my two naughty splodges that were, were accidents. And I said that if I put a couple of dots elsewhere, they will suddenly look intended rather than an accident. So I need to do something with that. I like how the tail has gone. So I think I'm going to leave that alone, apart from maybe sorting out a couple of those marks. So that is what I need to do, but I will need to just hair dryer this for probably 30 seconds this time. So shall I just mute myself, Fiona, so you don't have to listen to the hair dryer just for 30 seconds? It wasn't too bad, actually. It seemed to... Um... Zoom sometimes cancels it out. It's got a, like a white noise cancellation, so I can try it if you're happy. Well, it was fine last time. Oh, okay, cool. I just didn't want to sort of... If you're too bad, I'll mute you. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I'm going. <laughs> Right. Did you survive that? We did. It, it's funny, actually. It just gives little slight squeakies as it moves around, but it's okay. You wouldn't lovely. know it was a hairdryer if you didn't see it. OK, that's lovely. So this is not totally dry. And usually I would say, you know, please check it's totally dry. Use the back of your hand. If it feels cool, that means there's still water in there. You know, don't touch it. But um, this is kind of a needs must situation, so tough. Um, I knew I wanted to work on that area, so I've made sure that was pretty dry and I can see wetness there. Well, we're just going to live with that. Um, may I just say, I really like the pantaloons there. His, 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 um, just this leg, it's quite nice to have a sort of less fussy area, but to give your eyes somewhere to rest so um, I'm really pleased that I stopped soon on that that leg um, so and um, one thing I have noticed is you know I, I think I described it it looked a bit like piano keys I that is jarring with me so I'm gonna have to do something about that so let me grab my pen 
can't rem remember which one was the well-behaved pen. Hopefully it's that one. And all I'm going to do with my piano keys up here is just lengthen one of them. Uh, which one shall we do? Let's lengthen this one. And it'll just stop it being too regular and just slightly lengthen that. And I think we'll be OK. I say it was just the fact they were four in a row, all of the same length was just annoying my eye. It makes such a difference. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know how you look at something, you just say, oh, that's naughty, don't like that. Or sometimes you, you know something's bothering you and, of course, you can't work out what it is, at which point you need to put it to one side and look at it sort of a day later with fresh eyes. Um, or look at it in a mirror or do all those little tricks that just help you see what's going on. And suddenly you think, aha, I know. Well, you hope. So I'm coming down here and I'm just wanting, I'm going to repeat some of these marks, the smudgy marks. And again, it's just making them look intentional rather than accidental. Um, it's a shame this owl, has, uh, not owl, eagle, hasn't got any really interesting markings. The, the owl I showed you at the beginning had wonderful markings, bars on its uh, feathers, but th this eagle doesn't have those and they can be jolly good fun and terribly useful for disguising all sorts of problems, but that's not the case here. Um, and I thought, hmm, what do I want to do with this? I think a couple of a little more precise marks might be the appropriate thing to do. It's only going to be small. And then just looking really carefully here. I'm a little nervous of doing round the eye because if I make a mess of this, I've messed the whole thing up um because of course we are we look straight to the eye so these are tiny marks that i'm making we're really at sort of adjustment stage here um just to emphasize a few places rather than anything dramatic but sometimes it's just the tiny little marks that make all the difference so let's really look round. happy with those happy with that yeah I think we're probably getting there so now I needed to be brave and work out where my disguised dot is going and it's going up there and because I like triangles, I mean, we, we as human beings like triangles, threes. So by those were my mistakes, but by adding a couple up there, hopefully it now looks like I had planned it all along. I'm just going to put a couple of tiny little dots in. And again, you have to be careful with spatter. It's so easy to think, oh, I don't know what this painting needs. Oh, I'll bung on a bit of spatter and you end up with your painting looking like it's got chicken pox. Um, it has to be for a reason. And here, partly it was to disguise my mistake, but also to get your eye moving around the, the, the um, painting. Now I'm just gonna take off the excess of that ink by just wicking it away with a little bit of kitchen towel. It's just to minimize any chances of me smudging and the fact that it will just take forever to dry if I leave it that thick. So I'm just going to wick that away. And this little one over here. Right, that's better. 
So I think that is probably as much as I would do because I say if far, far better to stop too soon than too late. And if tomorrow I look at this and think, oh, I really should have done dot, 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 then I can do it. Whereas if I look at it tomorrow and think I really shouldn't have done dot, 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 um, I can't undo it. I am just making this rounder, this dot down here. It was a funny shape and I wasn't happy, so I've just made it rounder. And I say these things when I'm teaching. I say, oh, you know, don't fiddle, put your brush down, put your pen down, stop too soon rather than too late. And of course, I'm as bad as everyone else because you, you sit here and you think, oh, I could just do and I could do that. And it's usually best just to stop, look at it with fresh eyes tomorrow and think, Yep, that's fine. Or no, I'll do whatever. So that is my eagle, I reckon. It's just a tiny bit too big to get onto the, the um, camera, isn't it? So I'm going to do a little moving eagle here so you can see what's going on. Um, oh, do you know, I've just noticed I've only got three talons on this foot and on that. Oh, no, I have got the other talon. And it should have four talons. The other toe is behind. So see, this is the sort of thing you do notice, but we can sort that out. Um, gosh, we'd hate, hate to have this poor eagle having lost a, a talon. There. Just got a talon behind and we the other one is, yeah, that's fine. Oh, good don't get three toed eagles what's it i think ostriches only have two toes but uh mm. eagles definitely have four right there you go wow <laughs> so has anyone got any questions well, do unmute yourselves to ask some questions um i love those feathers on the his his left wing the one on the right and how Yes, yeah, so how you've just got the um, the ink and then the, the watercolour makes the rest of the feather and just works so really well. It's lovely. So, sorry, let me not uh, monopolise the chat. <laughs> Come on, ask some questions. Yeah. Can you adopt the same approach to uh, any uh, bird? Do you do uh, garden birds uh, in the same sort of uh, way as you've tackled an eagle, which is a slightly... Uh, uh, sort of larger and chunkier uh, beast. Well, it yes. Um, I mean, with the cola pen, um, I have done other birds. I just find because of its strength, it's particularly lovely with um, uh, birds of prey. But I've I've certainly used it for things like oh uh, puffins, and I probably wouldn't use it. Oh, actually, no, I have. I've done sparrows. So, yes, I have. Mm. It's, I just particularly like it to say for, for birds of prey. I also really love using the cola pen for sort of urban sketching and for buildings. Um, they all end up a little wonkier than they might be in real life, but it's a really nice pen for that. And even portraits. So, it, it is flexible. Um, so, sometimes I think with garden birds, I would probably maybe use, say, the glass pen, which gives a lovely flowing, very fine line, um, which I feel is maybe more in keeping with the lightness of, and the delicacy of, of the birds. So I, I sometimes like to sort of match things up, but um, I have done it uh, with, with this sort of approach. But some of it, I say, is possibly just a little too chunky, I think was the word you use. And I think you're right for, I don't know, a, a robin or a skylark or something like that. It's something that's a bit more lyrical. I would probably use different approach. Thank you. Mm. Any more questions, anybody? Can I, can I ask a, a question about the Indian ink? 
Yeah. Um, when you're drying with the Indian ink, if you spray that line with your little water spray, does it soften it or does it just mm -hmm. stay? No. Right, let me show you. Indian ink is just gorgeous in water. So mm. if I wet the paper, just clean water, and then put in Indian ink, it's, can I? So it, it's just, it's beautiful in water. Let me pull that up so you can see. And it really responsive on the surface. Wonderful, you know, you want to paint a black cat, a nice furry black cat. You're laughing, aren't you? Um, equally well, if you, as you say, if, if so, if the line is wet and you spray it, it will move. Um, which may or may not, of course, be what you, you want, but it can be really lovely. And what you'll find with uh, if you dilute Indian ink um, with water, it granulates a lot as well, um, especially if your water is hard. I, I live in the Thames Valley and our water is hideous. Um, it's really hard and, and it um, makes the Indian ink granulate, um, which of course is a lovely, lovely effect. Um, What's your water? You're down in Surrey, so or Surrey, Sussex. So your water's probably pretty hard down there, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so you'll you'll it virtually curdles the the ink. Um, you could always use distilled water if that's not an effect you like. But actually, just painting with Indian ink is lovely, and I do quite a lot of that. I, I work on canvas um, that I've prepared with watercolor ground and then use Indian ink on top of that to get these sorts of lovely, soft, feathery marks. Um, you know, and that's a beautiful way of working. Uh, it's, you know, just great fun and it, it does it all by itself, but you can get some beautiful effects. As I say, I think Indian ink is just gorgeous. Mm. Could you show us that bottle again? Where'd you get your Indian ink? Um, I mean, this, I'm just making sure the lid's on. <laughs> um, this I got from, she says, was it from Sea White? Usually I use Jackson's. So um, I, I use Jackson's. I got this from, oh, Artway. I don't know if you've come across Artway. They're a, more a sort of school and college supplier based in, devices and I think I was doing an order for sketchbooks they do really nice sort of eco sketchbooks um, and I needed to make up my order <laughs> so that I got free postage not that I'm really mean and tight but um, so I think that came from Artway because I used it to make up to the uh, 40 pounds or whatever it was they, they demanded um, but yeah, Jackson's Indian ink is lovely. It's really waterproof. And the nice thing with the ink, you've got, it's got shellac in it. Um, so you can, it almost dries to a slight shine. I don't, don't think we can particularly see it on here, um, but it, it has a slight sheen to it, which is really nice. So uh, Jackson's is really good, but just check that it's waterproof because Windsor and Newton do a non-waterproof Indian ink. They do a waterproof version and a non-waterproof version. So if you pick the wrong one by mistake, you're going to be in for a nasty, nasty surprise. Mm. So double check. Thank you. Sure. Would you would you like to tell people how you finish off your watercolors on canvas? Because oh, well, you can't put them behind glass, do you? Oh no. So um. I don't know if you could see over my shoulder. Uh, if you've got, if can you highlight the um, yeah. not my face, but my, the head-on view? Are you all right to spotlight that? Yes. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Now, and if I move this for a second, can you see over my shoulder? This is watercolor on canvas, so it's the same eagle. Um, and you prepare the canvas using watercolor ground. Sorry, I feel a bit strange, sort of. Um, 
And then on this one, I've just uh, sealed it with a spray varnish that's got some UV protection in. But sometimes I wax them using Dorland's wax, um, which is cold wax medium, which is lovely. And you can you put it on. It's just a paste. Um, let when it dries, you can buff it and it comes to a lovely sort of soft sheen like waxing a piece of furniture but it has lovely soft sheen and it really enhances the colors which is is fab so i'll put that back now but but yes so um yeah water on color on canvas is is great um and i've written a book about it i'm allowed to say that wow. <laughs> i've got two books but watercolor on canvas um just liberates you from sort of the tyranny of glass and frame um, I love working on paper, but I love working on canvas because you can go big. Um, you know, I've done meter by meter sort of watercolours, which if you were on paper, one, you'd need to source huge sheets of paper. And two, you can just imagine the cost of framing something that size and the weight of it. You'd have to reinforce a wall to hang that on. So um, watercolour on canvas really gives you some freedom if you want to do something sort of bigger. Lovely. And so you just, do you apply that with a cloth and then buff it with a clean soft cloth? Or, or what the, the, um, the wax? Mm. Uh, I just use my fingers because I quite like it. I'm a very tactile person. So it's um, not harmful. It hasn't got any horrible solvents in. It's based around... Uh, beeswax and I'm going to say hmm, I don't mean Daymar varnish so there is some varnish element in there so it, it's not so it is a paste and you just literally rub it in with your fingers let it dry and then just buff it with a cloth it's it's a very easy process but it's it's actually terribly satisfying because it really brings the colors out which is lovely and it doesn't move the watercolour or anything? No, no, because watercolour is water soluble. Mm. This is wax. There is no water in it. So it doesn't move the watercolours. Whereas, say, if you'd used, I don't know, pencil, because a lot of pencils have a wax element in it, it mm. would smudge it. Or if I oil pastels, you wouldn't be able to um, wax over that without smudging it because they would dissolve as such in in the wax but because watercolor is is water soluble it's it's um it's perfect so i think do some people use it over acrylics and oils as well just as a, a finish um, i don't i don't know certainly with you could over oils it's used i'm not sure with acrylics mm. um you could, but I'm not sure what the point would be because um, it, I say it buffs up to that beautiful sheen. And of course, you've got to shine with, with acrylics anyway, and you don't need that protection in the same way. So I'm not sure. I think you could, but I don't know why you would. Mm, right. If right. that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, what was the name of that wax again? Dorlands, D O R. L A N D S. It's an American product. Um, you can again get it from places like Jackson's. You can get it online. Um, it's lovely because it doesn't have an odor. It doesn't, you know, do anything hideous to your hands um, or your lungs, which is always good news. Um, so it's a really nice finish. You can use it on, on watercolours on paper because sometimes I, I will mount a, a watercolour that I've done on paper. I will mount it onto a um, cradle board, you know, a wooden cradle board and then wax it to protect it. And again, that's another way of getting away from having to have glass and a mount. Because um, I just sometimes find that glass interferes it gets between you and the image um, and sometimes particularly because I like sort of natural subjects you want them to feel like they're coming out at you not trapped behind glass so that's possible and you can just wax um, on onto the paper and it preserves it it seals it 
so that if I accidentally spilled a cup of coffee on <laughs> you or know, splash something up on, on the wall, uh, it would be fine um, and just protects it and protects it obviously against moisture in the atmosphere and pollutants and all those sorts of things. So Dorland's is lovely, really nice product. Oh, Annette's asked, do you use pens on your canvas? Right, uh, I do. Um, canvas is really tough on pens. So if you used, she says, um, you know, typical micron type pen on canvas, you'll find that the nib wears very quickly. I wouldn't use a cola pen on the canvas because you've got the texture of the canvas and it would just keep catching. It would just, you wouldn't get the flow of it. Um, I have used glass pens on canvas and they're not great. So um, I do tend to use micron pens on canvas and just know that they're gonna wear out. But you know, given that a pen like this is probably I don't know, a pound, um, I can live with the fact that it's going to ruin the nib. I use lots of ink on canvas and then spray it and paint with it and move it. Um, and then probably just use some of these to bring in that tiny little bit of detail that you want. Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Any more questions from anybody else before we... No? Uh, could you send um, a, a photograph of your picture, please? The finished picture or the reference picture? Uh, the finished one, please. Oh, yes, of course. You could, you could send both if you like. <laughs> yes, yeah, Thank well, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, wait, wait, I'll, wait. I'll wait till it's um, morning and I okay. can take a picture lovely. in the light. <laughs> we'll put it in our newsletter. Oh, lovely. Yeah, okay. yeah cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, in case you decide there are any other little bits that just need a little <laughs> <laughs> as if I would do that <laughs> oh dear the temptation to carry on poking at a picture is overwhelming but I shall resist well thank you so much Liz um I hope everybody else has enjoyed this as much as I have it's been fascinating to see how you work I mean I've I've been able to see some of your work in person before which is lovely but to actually see it being created is is just fascinating i'm not a watercolorist but it it makes me want to have a go now you know i want to get want to have a play with it you know so so thank you so much for that and um can we all just say thank you very much to liz thank you very much, much. Thank, you. thank you no thank you for making me so welcome that's lovely and um it's been nice to be able to spend a creative evening with you so uh, I hope some of you are inspired to have a go because it is just such fun um and yeah lovely way of working lovely well thank you so much thank you very much thank you very much thank you happy Christmas happy new year to everybody Oh, okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.